Haiti's civil protection confirms 51 fatalities and 18 missing persons the after downpours and floodings. The Caribbean nation also reels in the aftermath of a 5.7 magnitude earthquake. And Canada praises the worst forest fire season in years, with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau calling the situation particularly serious. And the United Nations organization considers that the reopening of the Iranian embassy in Saudi Arabia is very useful for the region, taking into account the strong influence of both countries in the area. And from the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south. I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada, and these are the news. The number of dead and missing from the floods in Haiti has risen. Civil protection confirms 51 fatalities and 18 missing people. Haitian authorities and the representation of the United Nations remain alert because the rains will continue until Thursday. They will especially affect the northeast and the southeast of the country. The Caribbean nation, hit by multiple crises and in the last hours by an earthquake of 4.9 magnitude, presented a preliminary balance of the damage caused by the rains in addition to 140 people injured. There are almost 40,000 families affected and considerable agricultural and livestock losses. And also at least three people were killed and several injured on Tuesday in Haiti as a result of a 4.9 magnitude earthquake that struck the south of the country, authorities said. The U.S. Geological Survey reported that the earthquake was reported in the early hours of the morning in the city of Jeremy while specifying that the earthquake had a depth of 10 kilometers. However, the departments of Grand Anse and Nips were also shaken. On Tuesday, the spokesperson for the UN Secretary General Stéphane Dujarric lamented the effects or the impacts of the earthquakes that struck Haiti and expressed the organization's willingness to work together with the authorities to offer all necessary assistance to the Haitian people. The families of the victims and wishes a speedy recovery to all those injured. The UN stands ready to work with the Haitian authorities and other partners to help ease the suffering of those in need as it relates to the earthquake and, of course, uh, the other natural disaster, which is the flooding and, um, and landslides we've seen in the past few days. Stéphane Dujarric also referred to the tragic consequences left by the heavy rains and informed that the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs is working with UNICEF. Our humanitarian colleagues are telling us that Grand Anse was already impacted by the torrential rains and uh, that I just mentioned. The Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs is working with UNICEF, the World Food Program, and the International Organization for Migration to support communities around the capital Port-au-Prince that were hardest hit by the floods and landslides. WFP is ready to distribute some 30, 350,000 hot meals and other food assistance to those who need it the most. And we'd say in line, Canada is facing the worst fire season in years, as Prime Minister Justin Trudeau warned that the situation is becoming particularly serious. The gigantic smoke plumes that have even darkened New York in the neighboring country, United States. The head of the Forest Service assured that it has an unprecedented season, adding that the extent of the burnt area could reach record levels. The Canadian Premier, for his part, explained that they are designing a plan B in case their resources reach their limits. The situation in Quebec is especially serious. As of June the 4th, there were more than 400 active fires. France, the United States and South Africa, among other nations, have offered their help. The Brazilian president, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, promised that the deforestation in the Amazon will cease by 2030. The government of the South American nation plans to achieve that goal by strengthening the laws on environmental crimes. Lula pointed out that the plan for the prevention and the control of deforestation in the Amazon establishes a coordinated policy among more than a dozen ministries until the end of his term in 2027. The initiative establishes greater use of technology and satellite images to track criminal activity the regularization of land titles and the use of a rural registry to monitor forest management and forest recovery. 
We have just relaunched the action plan to combat deforestation in the legal Amazon, an area of more than 5 million square kilometers comprising nine states in the Amazon basin, which in its previous version during my first two terms of office produced the greatest reduction in deforestation rates in the Amazon in its entire history. We are restarting the creation of protected areas, parks and reserves. And the U.S. business persons announced in Havana, Cuba, their interest in establishing trade relations to supply foodstuff to the island, despite the U.S. blockade. During a press conference at the Cuban Chamber of Commerce, business persons Mark Baum and Jorge Ignacio Fernandez emphasized their intention to explore the needs of the Cuban people and the potentials of trade. Many people and businesses also think that Cuba cannot be touched because during the Trump era everything was closed. But that is not the case. You can do a lot of business and there are no problems and this is one of the sectors to block. One of the objectives of our foundation, and you can visit our website, is to support and humanize relations with Cuba, which means lifting the blockade because it hurts innocent people. It was written 63 years ago, and it says, let's hurt the Cuban people. It is not humanitarian. Let's take a short break, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesur English, where you will find the news in different formats, news updates and more. Other stories coming up, stay with us. Welcome back. Russia's ambassador to the UN, Vasily Rebenzia, claimed that Kiev's forces were behind the partial destruction of this important dam and regret that part of the international community was ignoring its demands and automatically blaming Moscow for the events. Hours after the collapse of the gate beams at the top of the Kakhova hydroelectric plant in the Kherson region, causing flooding and the displacement of thousands of people, the UN Security Council held a special meeting in New York to discuss this issue. On the night of June 6, the Kyiv regime committed an unthinkable crime, exploding the dam of the Kakova hydroelectric power plant, resulting in an uncontrolled discharge of water downstream on the Dnieper River. Settlements have been flooded. Thousands of people are in need of evacuation, and that evacuation has already begun. Colossal damage has been dealt to the agriculture of the region and the ecosystems of the Dnieper estuary. I want to emphasize that the leadership of the armed forces of Ukraine had openly declared their readiness to blow up this dam to gain a military advantage as far back as last year. On Tuesday, Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu said that the Kyiv regime tried to launch an offensive over the past three days but was unsuccessful. On June 4, the forces of the 23rd and 31st mechanized brigades of the armed forces of Ukraine attempted an offensive in five directions. The enemy did not achieve success in any of them and suffered significant losses. 300 military personnel, 16 tanks, 26 armored combat vehicles and 14 vehicles. On June 5, the Kiev regime attempted an offensive in seven directions with a force of five brigades. It was stopped and suffered even more significant losses. More than 1,600 military personnel, 28 tanks, including A Leopards and 3MX-10 wheel tanks. 136 units of other military equipment, including 79 foreign ones. Attempted attacks were tortured. The enemy was stopped. Russian soldiers and officers are showing courage and heroism in battles. I repeat, the enemy did not achieve its goals, but suffered significant and incomparable loss. On Tuesday, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin stated that most Asian countries are opposed to NATO's expansion into the region. 
Wan Wenbin has said that the majority of the Asian countries oppose the creation of military blocks in the region and will not allow a repeat of cold or hybrid wars in Asia. The official detailed that NATO countries are obsessed with its world expansion into the Asia-Pacific region, although they have repeatedly said they don't want to expand. According to the Chinese official, the main purpose of the expansion into the region is to intervene in regional affairs and provoke a black confrontation. This regard has made the international community, especially Asian countries, very vigilant. I said yesterday that most countries in the region are very clear on this issue and are opposed to the establishment of various military blocs in the region. They don't welcome NATO extending its tentacles into Asia. They don't accept a repeat of bloc confrontation in Asia, and they will not allow a repeat of cold or hot war in Asia. NATO should keep a clear head of this issue. Japan should also make the right choice for regional stability and development. Do not do anything that undermines mutual trust among countries in the region and harms regional peace and stability. Wan Wenbin also calls on the countries of the Asian bloc to respect the efforts of Asian countries to establish a nuclear weapon-free zone in Southeast Asia. China has always strongly supported the efforts of ASEAN countries to establish a nuclear weapon-free zone in Southeast Asia and was the first nuclear weapon state to openly support the treaty on the establishment of a Southeast Asian nuclear weapon-free zone and expressed its willingness to sign the protocol to the treaty. We once again urge the United States, the United Kingdom and Australia to take the concerns of the international community seriously and to stop cooperation on nuclear submarines which is an act of nuclear proliferation. And Telesur English continues to grow. You can now tune in from 33 different African countries using Storsat. Dial 461 and enjoy our Latin American alternative broadcast. One final short break and we'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. The United Nations said on Wednesday that the reopening of Iran's embassy in Saudi Arabia is helpful for the region. At a daily press briefing, UN spokesperson Stefan Dujaric highlighted as a positive move for the region that both nations are engaged in open and constructive dialogue, especially two countries with so much influence in the area. Iran reopened its embassy in Saudi Arabia on Tuesday after seven years of closure, nearly three months after the two countries agreed to restore bilateral ties under a China broker deal. Let us recall that in March, Saudi Arabia and Iran reached a groundbreaking agreement in Beijing to resume diplomatic relations and reopen their embassies and missions. And the Kenyan police fired tear gas and arrested 11 protesters on Tuesday during a rally in Nairobi against a new finance bill that the critics said will pile more economic hardships on the ordinary people. A group of about 100 protesters marched towards parliament chanting down, down finance bill and waving placards reading will more taxation lead to low cost of living and poverty is man-made. Parliament resumed its sessions on Tuesday after recess and is expected to debate the legislation this week. The proposed legislation, known as the Finance Bill 2023, calls for new or increased taxes on a wide range of items, including fuel and food, as well as beauty products, cryptocurrencies and social media influencers. Witnessing, we are witnessing some chaos, which is not right for our us as Kenyans, we need to live like we are in a country. We don't have to have fear that uh, we are going to be chased because we are fighting for our rights. So uh, people are in the streets to demonstrate their anger, their frustrations, to demonstrate everything. We are suffering in short. People need money and that money is being taxed. You are being taxed twice. 
for something that you need to get free. So we need that financial ability to go down. We are demonstrating because the cost of living is high. We want the cost of living to come down because most of the youth are unemployed. We have single mothers who are unable to cater for themselves. It is imperative for the cost of living to go down so that everybody is able to sustain themselves. And the Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni landed in Tunis on Tuesday for a day of talks with the nation's leaders during which she is expected to address the increased number of migrants leaving Tunisia for Italy. Meloni was greeted at the airport by the Tunisian Premier Najla Boden and then held meetings with the President Kai Zayed. The two leaders were also expected to talk about energy questions and financial issues that the African nation is facing. And after a meeting with the Tunisian president, Kai Zayed, the Italian Prime Minister, Giorgia Meloni, held a meeting with the country's Prime Minister, Najla Boden. During the meeting, the Italian leader said Rome supports efforts to secure an IMF bailout for Tunisia and to deal with its growing migration problem. In full respect of Tunisia's sovereignty, I spoke to President Sayed about the efforts being made by a friendly country such as Italy to reach a positive conclusion for an agreement between Tunisia and the International Monetary Fund, which remains fundamental for a stronger and complete recovery of the country. Our work is also very important in regard to combating illegal migration. This is a phenomenon that affects both Tunis and Rome. We agreed with President Sayed that it is fundamental to strengthen cooperation in this arena according to an approach that cannot be exclusively security-based. On Tuesday, the Ethiopian government rejected a recent accusations by Human Rights Watch, the HRW, of a campaign of ethnic cleansing in the western region of Tigray. In a report, the Human Rights Organization claims that paramilitary units and militias from the neighboring Amhara region continue to force as part of a campaign of ethnic cleansing. And the war in Sudan is worsening the already serious humanitarian crisis in Central African Republic. A United Nations official said on Monday, Mohamed Ad Gayoya, the Deputy Special Representative of the Secretary General of the UN Mission in the Central African Republic, made the remarks at a press conference in Geneva. Due to armed violence, one in five Central Africans is either an IDP or a refugee in neighboring countries. Um, it is against this background that the ongoing conflict in Sudan is uh, unfortunately also exacerbating the situation in uh, We have more than 13,000 people, actually a little bit less than 14,000, uh, including Central African returnees who have prevented fled from Sudan to Amdafok uh, in Kar on one side, uh, and about 10,000 people have also fled uh, Chad, uh, both Chadians, but also Central African returnees who have also came into a uh, car. On Tuesday, the airspace force of the Islamic Revolution Garden Crowds of Iran presented before the President Ibrahim Raisi its first hypersonic missile called Conqueror. The entity reported that the projectile has a range of 1,400 kilometers and reaches speeds of March 13 to March 15 before hitting the target. On Tuesday, South African President Cyril Ramaphosa held a joint press conference with his Portuguese counterpart, the President Marcelo Rabelo de Souza, who is on official visit to the South African country. The two presidents held bilateral talks on a number of issues, including the ongoing conflict in Mozambique, agreeing on their mutual efforts to address security issues related to the conflict. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesorienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Telesor English, I'm Yorenko Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.